That, that's the beauty of this, this conference. It, it's always got people and topics that I'm not smart enough to think about myself. And I come here and I just get wiser and I just meet more interesting people. Uh, and I hear discussions about things that are so important uh, in my world. And, and uh, Roland, you kicked it off very beautifully with uh, a real broad view of what's going on. And, and now we're going to take it, uh, take it a little narrower, although not much, because we're going to be speaking to a, a Federal Reserve uh, president. That's a big deal even in my world where uh, I cover economics on a, a daily basis and I, and I think about uh, what the Federal Reserve does. And frankly, all of us are thinking about the Federal Reserve these days more uh, than we normally do. Uh, and in some cases, more than the Fed would like us to. Uh, Dennis Lockhart is the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Atlanta. He uh, took office there in uh, 2007. He's the 14th president of uh, the, the Atlanta Fed. He's responsible for all the bank's activities, including monetary policy, bank supervision, and regulation, and he sits on the Fed's uh, open market, uh, the, the monetary policy body, the Federal Fed Open Market Committee. They're the ones who meet, and in the olden days, used to decide what you paid uh, in interest rates, although things happening these days mean that the Fed says and intends to do one thing, and the market sees it differently and behaves differently. Um, prior to joining the Fed, he was the chairman of the Small uh, Enterprise Assistance Funds, which was a sponsor and operator of emerging market venture capital, private equity funds, something that Louise was talking about as being crucial to, the, uh, to the, the functioning of our economy. He was also managing partner at the private equity firm Zephyr Management from 2001 to 2003. And he was with Citibank, where he worked in Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Greece, and Iran. Uh, all of which are front and center in the news today. Even Greece is back. Um, Greece has not had this much news in 3,000 years. Um, so Dennis Lockhart has uh, a lot of great depth and involvement in matters that, that uh, pertain to all of us. I invite you, Dennis, to, uh, to address the group. Well, thank you, <clears throat> thank you for that introduction, uh, Sheikh Ali. <clears throat> and to Al Jazeera in its uh, recent launch, Mabruk. That's what I remember from the time I lived in the Middle East. Uh, I want to thank the Louise Blanc uh, Foundation uh, for summoning this leadership summit and inviting me to be a part of the, uh, the event. Today I want to talk about a trait that has characterized the U.S. economic life, often with positive comparisons to other advanced economies. And that trait is economic dynamism. This is a broad concept with dimensions such as innovation, entrepreneurship, new business formation, which Louise spoke about a moment ago, risk tolerance and risk taking, labor mobility, and job creation. The question I want to address is whether the economic dynamism of the United States is declining. Is America losing its economic mojo? On this question, there are many opinions out there, no scarcity of anecdotes supporting those opinions. I'm going to try to step beyond the world of anecdote and to the extent possible, look at the evidence. I will explore what the data tell us about this question. A couple of caveats up front. I won't be able to give comprehensive and exhaustive treatment to this subject in the few minutes that I have this morning. So I plan to look at three interrelated aspects of the subject. Job reallocation, job creation and job destruction, productivity growth, and new business formation. And I won't offer a definitive answer. My remarks are intended to raise awareness and contribute to an ongoing conversation. As always, I'm not speaking for the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Open Market Committee. These are my personal views, and my colleagues in the Federal Reserve System may not agree. I'll start with a very brief uh, economic context for thinking about economic dynamism. As you may already know, the Federal Reserve pursues two main longer-run objectives through its economic policies price stability, and maximum employment. 
in the post-recession recovery period, the employment objective has been the more challenging of the two. The recovery has been underway from, uh, for now for more than four years. Unemployment at its peak reached 10 percent. The official unemployment rate now stands at 7.3 percent, somewhat higher than the 5.3 to 6 percent range that many economists refer to as full employment. We've made a lot of progress, uh, but there's a way to go before the Fed can claim that the maximum employment objective has been achieved. Significant progress has been accomplished just in the past year. The official unemployment rate has fallen from 8.1 percent to 7.3 percent, and payroll employment has grown by about 2.2 million jobs. Payroll job gains for the past 12 months have averaged 184,000 per month, but recently there seems to have been uh, some slowing. The monthly average for the most recent three months is 148,000. This progress on the Fed's uh, employment objective has been recorded in spite of rather weak economic growth. Over the 17 quarters of recovery since the recession ended, GDP growth has averaged a little above 2.2 percent. This is a lackluster pace of growth and the progress we're enjoying on the jobs front makes sense only in the presence of low labor productivity growth. That is, in fact, the reality. Labor productivity growth is averaging significantly below historical norms, and I'll return to this concern in a moment. Let me introduce the concept of employment dynamics. Employment in America is in a constant state of churn. Workers are entering and leaving the labor force. Employers are moving from one firm, employees are moving from one firm to another. Firms are changing the composition of jobs in their workforces. Firms are adding jobs in one category while eliminating jobs in another. All of this movement is a good thing on balance. It is part of an economy that is continuously adjusting to shifting reality by reallocating resources from sector to sector, industry to industry, firm to firm, and job type to job type. A particular type of churn is called job reallocation. The rate of job reallocation across firms can be measured. During the 1990s, job creation at expanding firms and destruction at shrinking firms taken together typically amounted to about 16% uh, of the total private sector employment per quarter. To put that figure in context, private sector payroll employment today is around 113 million. A 16% job reallocation figure would amount to roughly 18 million jobs created and destroyed per quarter. This is a picture clearly of a very dynamic economy. Since the early 2000s, however, the job reallocation rate has slowed. The most recent data for 2012 suggests that the quarterly reallocation rate is now closer to 12% or 14 million jobs per quarter. Interpreting this apparent loss of dynamism across firms is not straightforward. It could be that these slowing dynamics are not a bad thing if we get the same growth of productivity we've enjoyed in the past without so much churning of jobs. But that doesn't quite fit with the low productivity growth we've experienced during this recovery. At the level of the business firm, we observe similar trends in measures of internal employment flows. An expanding firm is one whose hires 
exceed its separations. Separations, it means quits, retirements, and layoffs. A firm that is expanding its payroll must hire employees both to replace some separations and to fill the newly created jobs. A firm that is shrinking its workforce has more separations than hires. The data show that both the rate of hiring and the rate of separations have also been declining since the early 2000s. Some of this decline reflects the rate at which people are voluntarily quitting their current jobs to do something else, including going to work for a different employer. On this dimension also, there has been uh, a decline with the drop most evident during the last recession. Putting these various pieces together, we see a picture in which fewer firms are expanding employment and each expanding firm is adding fewer new jobs on average than in the past. At the same time, fewer firms are shrinking their employment and each is downsizing by less on average. Fewer people are being laid off or are quitting their job and firms are hiring fewer people. In other words, the employment dynamics of the U.S. economy are slower. The low rate of hiring has contributed, contributed to an unusually weak flow of unemployed people into the workforce. Even though the unemployment rate has declined from 10% at peak to 7.3% in the most recent reading, the flow rate from U, unemployment, to E, employed, dropped from close to 30% a month prior to the recession to 16% during the recession and has improved only marginally over the past four years. Low job finding prospects are almost certainly contributing to a larger share of unemployed workers leaving the labor market. <clears throat> While baby boomer retirement demographics are a partial exp explanation, this outflow of potential workers from unemployment is a factor behind the sharp decline in labor force participation we've witnessed in recent years. I will mention one final dimension of employment dynamics, and that is a shift in the mix of jobs from full-time to part-time. A number of people who report they are working part-time, a number of people report they are working uh, part-time when they would prefer to work full-time, what economists call part-time for economic reasons. And this number rose sharply during the recession and remains high. You can conclude that the unemployment rate does not fully capture the true underutilization of labor resources today in our economy. Now I'd like to return to the subject of productivity growth, which is the second piece of the economic dynamism question as I've framed it. Recently, the rate of productivity growth has been significantly below its historical norm. In my official economic outlook submitted a week ago as part of the Federal Open Market Committee's forecasting exercise, I have assumed we are experiencing a temporary spell of low productivity growth that will correct itself. I am assuming that this will happen, this will happen as demand kicks into higher gear and as businesses expand production somewhat faster than they expand their payrolls. The likely direction of productivity measures in our economy is the subject, however, of considerable debate. Another more concerning possibility is that the slow advance of productivity reflects a fundamentally less dynamic economy. There are innovation pessimists, for example, who question the potential for transformative technological change in coming decades. This is a very important subject, but I'm going to leave it for others in this conference to weigh in on. At a ground level, 
The productivity question is a bit of a puzzle in my view. In many, <clears throat> excuse me, in many conversations with business leaders in recent years, I've heard accounts of lots of productivity oriented investment. Investment in software, automation, and robotics, for example. This would have resulted in enhanced productivity within a firm. But there is a between firms aspect of, uh, as well. Historically, the process of shifting resources from less productive sectors and firms to more productive activities has been an important driver of overall productivity growth. But as already noted in my discussion of employment dynamics, resource allocation appears to have been on a declining trend in recent years. Finally, let me comment on the third component of, of my uh, mojo triad, if you will, and that is new business formation. The American economy benefits from an extraordinary ongoing dynamic that is, well, a dynamic. New businesses are launched. Some survive the startup phase, but it's just as likely they fail in the early years. Some of the survivors grow rapidly. Much job creation and destruction accompanies this process of startup, survival, or failure. Young firms account for a significant share of both job creation and job destruction. In that sense, young firms are a key factor in the cycle of job reallocation in the economy. The vast majority of new businesses do not have highly ambitious growth aspirations. They start small and they stay small. However, a few new firms des desire to grow substantially and an even smaller fraction of these will actually succeed and take off. These high growth survivors generate a lot of new jobs and contri contribute to raising overall productivity, often by taking market share from less productive incumbents and through product innovation. The data on new business formation slow, uh, show a slowdown in recent years, paralleling the decline in overall job creation and, and destruction. The rate of new business formation took an especially large hit during the last recession <clears throat> and has been slow to recover. The data suggests that there has been very little growth in the number of businesses being launched since the end of the recession. And those that are starting are creating fewer new jobs on average. So why is that? Why, why has there been a slowdown? There's been a general atmosphere of uncertainty in the wake of the financial crisis and recession. Also, as Louise mentioned, uh, access to startup financing and tighter credit have constrained the flow of new firms. Until recently, the collapse in real estate values all but extinguished an important source of startup financing for many entrepreneurs. Similarly, tight standards on personal credit cards limited another important source of startup funds. The situation is improving as real estate values rise and credit standards ease somewhat. However, it's also possible that the sluggish pace of new business formation reflects others, other possibly more entrenched factors such as regulatory barriers to starting a business. Demographics may also play a role. An older population is not as ambitious and risk-taking as one that is on average younger. We at the Atlanta Fed have been trying to learn more about the aspects of the entrepreneurial ecosystem that have been particularly important in fostering high growth businesses. Borrowing a term coined by the Kauffman Foundation, my research staff is undertaking what we call the Gazelle Project. We've been looking at the early stage development stories of a number of successful young businesses 
so-called gazelles, in my region of the country, the southeast. One of the interesting preliminary findings is that is of this research is that knowledge of and access to high quality talent, social networks, and local support resources are critical. That is, businesses start in a particular location for a reason, because entrepreneurs know the place has the key resources they need. It's encouraging, I think, that so many local communities, local, local leaders have taken up the challenge of strengthening their entrepreneurial environments. That's true here in New York, it's in, true in Atlanta, it's quite, in, in, in fact, it's quite true all over the world. I don't think it's an over uh, overstatement to say there is a nascent entrepreneurship movement underway led by community leaders. So against this backdrop of declines in the rate of job and worker reallocation, slower new business formation, and a subpar rate of productivity growth, is there a call to action? I think yes. And can public policy do anything to foster greater dynam dynamism? At a high level, a level, I think there are three things that public policy can do. First, public policy makers can try to remove obstacles to growth and entrepreneurship. For example, policies that discourage new business formation and disincentives to invest. Second, the, pub the public sector can contribute with positive pro-growth actions that address economic fundamentals, such as investment in human capital and critical productive infrastructure. And finally, I think there is a role for monetary policy. Monetary policy can help deliver appropriately favorable interest rate conditions that can promote faster economic recovery, always in a context of low and stable inflation. Monetary policy also plays a critical role in creating the most favorable conditions for other policy actions to do their work. The question I posed at the outset was whether the economic dynamism of the United States is declining. Is America losing its economic mojo? There is some evidence to the affirmative. I believe some of what we observe can be explained by the recent recession and the frustratingly slow recovery. There are reasons to believe that some of the decline is cyclical in nature and will reverse itself over time. Anything more will call for creative leadership, the subject of this conference. My congratulations to the Louise Blount Foundation for convening this very important event. And thank you very much. We like to think of job creation and mobility mm -hmm. as signs of a dynamic <coughs> workforce. You're adding creation there as if there's no value judgment. Well, I, I, I obviously I put the, um, the emphasis on net job creation. Got it. But um, what I think, I, what I tried to do in the talk which is probably lost on many people, is that it's not a one-way street. There's constant movement in an economy that is adaptable and as dynamic as this one. And that means that there are jobs being destroyed all the time. Every month, we follow closely the, uh, the uh, initial uh, unemployment claims. That number, by the way, has come down to sort of a historic average, which is a good thing. But that's a sign every month that there are people who are losing their jobs. That's, that's a tough one to explain because we're in the 300,000 range every week. Right, about 330, uh, people, I think, or right. 320 recently. And it, that's hard to figure for people. Is it, it really every week 330,000 people are filing for new unemployment claims? Because if I add that up on a monthly basis, that means there must be uh, close to a, more than a million people losing their jobs. But this is churn, right? And, and you know, churn is... Uh, important as a characteristic of an economy that is dealing with reality, that's, that's constantly adapting to the, the real circumstances. And um, so as regrettable as people losing jobs may be, um, it's part of this dynamism. We, we often talk about uh, 
you know the number of people who are unemployed in this country versus the number of jobs that are available uh, let's call it three million jobs available that are unfilled at the moment that also is a common characteristic right there are in a dynamic economy there will always be a number of jobs unfilled yeah I, I, there are many reasons for that um, I'll just give you a little anecdote you know my part of the uh, of the Federal Reserve System is the southeast and um, in my district is the state of Louisiana. Uh, the state of Louisiana has a relatively low unemployment rate, and when we talk to contacts across the oil and gas sector and the industrial sector of the Gulf, they say, look, we've got tons of unfilled jobs if you could just get people to move to Louisiana. But part of the issue is, you know, up, uprooting yourself from one part of the country to move to another part of the country for work. That, too, has slowed down over the last decade or more. So, um, you know, I didn't comment it on, uh, in my talk, but uh, internal migration seems to be slowing as well. You also talked about the unemployment rate uh, not fully capturing the underutilization of the workforce. I, I may not have said that the way you did. I, I really worry about this because when we report on unemployment and the next morning in the newspapers, uh, it, it talks about the unemployment rate having gone up or down, and generally speaking, the less sophisticated publications will talk about the number of jobs created as a secondary matter. Uh, and virtually none of them will talk about the labor force participation rate, uh, which I think is a very, very important topic. What are the implications of having a lower labor force participation rate now than we've had in some 30 years? Well, let me, let me first, as I touched on, I think, in, in my remarks, um, there are a number of, of explanations. Some of the decline in participation is simply demographics. It's the baby boom generation moving into retirement. That's even more complex than it appears because there's also a phenomenon of older workers working longer. Mm -hmm. But net-net, there's a, a, a retirement movement taking place demographically. Um, but there's also the phenomenon of discouraged workers who simply give up and uh, decide either, some of them decide to go back to school to get more training, uh, but others simply, in effect, uh, just drop out of the workforce and uh, devote themselves to, to household uh, activities or whatever. What's the implication um, of this? Well, uh, one way to think of it is the potential GDP, the potential output of the country, can be explained very simply by number of workers times work, mm -hmm. hours, output. It's a pretty simple equation. There are a number of ways to get the GDP, but that's one of them. So lower participation may mean, may mean somewhat lower potential for the economy. That, that's concerning. I, I, want, I know this isn't a policy speech, uh, and I know there are things you can and can't say, uh, but I, I have this question, and there may be, there's, I'm sure there's a comfortable way for you to answer it. Uh, what would interest rates be if the Federal Reserve made no regular purchases of, of bonds and mortgage-backed securities? In other words, what's a normal interest rate? I'm going to take the, the theme of your question and then not answer your question. <laughs> Really, the question is, should we be refinancing or not? The, uh, if, if, <laughs> if you go, I'm not going to answer that question. I know. If you, if you go and look at our long-term forecasts, I refer to this in my remarks as something I submitted last week. Uh, now we are forecasting through 2016, and part of that exercise asks for what we think the equilibrium interest rate for the federal funds rate target, that is the short-term policy rate, will be in the long term. Right. And since the long term is always sort of a theoretical exercise, it's a way of asking, <clears throat> what do we think that rate should be in normal times, whatever normal times are, and certainly in the long term. And I think most of the participants on the committee think that the Fed runs funds rate target in normal times would be about 4%. Today, it's zero to 25 basis points, effectively zero. So there is a long way to go. Now, just to give you a quick uh, personal history, I joined the Fed in 2007, and when I joined, the Fed funds target rate was 5.5%, and the unemployment rate was 4.5%. So 
you know, in a matter of a few years, things can, can change, sure. and in this case, normalize. But the longer run idea is something around 4%. And a prime rate is usually three three hundred basis points higher than that. So yeah, a seven, the seven prime percent. rate is is certainly one reference rate, right. maybe not the most important one sure. in, in in the market these days. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Uh, Dennis Lockhart, thanks so much for uh, for giving us some insight. We really really appreciate it. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. <laughs>